for this session, we will talk about your pre-engagement activities. If you still remember, during our introduction to your audit, we said that under pre-engagement activities, we determine the preconditions of the audit. And we say preconditions of the audit, if ever, we can accept the audit or we do not accept the audit. So either accept the audit or we do not accept the audit. So for pre-engagement, generally, you look into your engagement, whether whether um whether that is a new engagement or a recurring engagement so there are standards that will be used for a new engagement and standards also that we need to follow for recurring engagement but generally for preliminary engagement activities or pre-engagement activities what we do is we look into the preconditions of the audit but um uh, as we have discussed before, we look into integrity, independence, and your competence. And in the end of your pre-engagement activities, assuming you will accept the client, you will provide an engagement letter wherein you will now document your understanding over the audit. Okay, so let's start now your pre-engagement activities. So first... Purpose of pre-engagement activities. Pre-engagement activities assess the auditor in identifying and evaluating events or circumstances that may adversely affect the auditor's ability to plan and perform the audit engagement. So here, we are checking whether we can uh, really perform the audit engagement or not. That's why the main decision here is whether we will accept the client or we will reject the client. Now, what are the activities that we need to do? First, we check the management integrity. We check the auditor's independence. We check also our competence. And there is no misunderstanding with the client. Now, what is the purpose of such activity? For management integrity, the purpose of that activity is to ensure that there are no issues with client management integrity that may affect the willingness to continue the engagement. Now, what is the normal audit procedure to determine whether the management has an integrity or not, or whether it has issues with integrity? We perform procedures regarding acceptance or continuance of the client relationship. So generally, that is more about inquiry. And then we have here auditor's independence and competence. Here, we do this Activity to ensure that the auditor maintains the necessary independence and ability to perform the engagement. Now, for the ability to perform the engagement, generally, we see if ever we have the right staff or whether we are capable in uh, serving our client or in doing the audit. Next, uh, the audit procedures here to test independence and competence is to evaluate only your ethical requirements, including your independence. And then lastly, there is no misunderstanding with the client. This is to ensure that there is no misunderstanding as to the terms of the engagement. So your audit procedure here is to establish an understanding of the terms of the engagement. And we said to establish an understanding that is through an engagement letter. Again, we are under pre-engagement activity. The, the most important thing that we look at in a pre-engagement activity is whether or not we accept or reject our client. And we perform different activities whether to accept or reject our client. But generally, you look into the client whether that is a new client or a recurring client because there are different audit procedures done for new client and audit procedures for recurring client. So generally, with us, integrity, independence, and your competence. And this, once we say uh, we are independent, we have the competency, and the management has integrity, then you document your engagement through an engagement letter. So first, acceptance or continuance of client relationship. I told you earlier that for pre-engagement activity, you need to determine whether you will accept or reject a client. But that is dependent whether that is a new client or a recurring client. Let's start first for a new client. If that is a new client, meaning that is an initial audit, the main objective of the pre-engagement activity for a client 
integrity is to identify the attitude and business reputation of the client. We look into the client's operations and indications of an inappropriate limitation in the scope of work. Also, whether the client is involved in money laundering or other criminal activities. Now, to test or to evaluate client integrity, we have the following audit procedures. The first procedure is to investigate or research about the client background. Especially nowadays, with just a search in the web or in the internet, you can already see different articles or news about a particular business or a client. Or if ever the client is known, you can ask directly to the industry partners or within the engagement team. Also, you can inquire from other firm personnel or third parties as to the integrity of your client. Next, you can also communicate with prospective clients predecessor auditor. So who is a predecessor auditor? A predecessor auditor is a prior auditor, meaning you are accepting a new client and then before there is a prior auditor. There is a prior auditor. Now, in communicating with the predecessor auditor, we need to answer the following what to communicate and how do we communicate with the predecessor auditor. We start first with what to communicate. First, the reasons for change. Why is there a change for uh, auditor? So since there is a previous auditor, you need to ask what change? Why is there a change? Next, the information that might pertain to the integrity of the client. So you ask any information from the predecessor auditor about the integrity of the client. And then, if ever there are any disagreement with the predecessor, auditor, and the client regarding accounting principles or auditing procedures or other similarly significant matters. So this is more about disagreement as to the application or um, the usage of your different standards. Next, how do we communicate? So to communicate, you need to first ask your client's permission or consent. And to document that, it must be in writing. It must be in writing. Now, what if it is not permitted? You just need to consider the implication and you can decide whether to accept or reject the engagement here. Take note, you are just deciding whether you are accepting or rejecting the engagement. Therefore, there is no scope limitation yet if ever the client would not want you to communicate to your predecessor auditor to determine the integrity of the client because you did not accept yet. Now, once you see that the client does not want you to communicate with the predecessor auditor, it is based on your professional judgment, if ever, that will bear something as to the integrity of the client. So generally, you judge whether it's okay to still accept or you will already reject the engagement if ever the client will not permit. But generally, again, your decision here only is whether you will accept or reject. The decision is not yet whether you will um, modify your audit report because here you did not yet accept the client. Therefore, you just need to decide whether to accept or to reject. Next, auditability of the client's financial statement. Now, for the auditability of the client's financial statement, generally, we follow the concept of your um, preconditions. And what are these preconditions? That there is a framework or a suitable criteria. And also, aside from a suitable criteria, there must be a uh, agreement as to as to the responsibility of the management now if ever these preconditions are not uh, present then you can reject but if the precondition is present then you can accept because again you're doing an audit to check whether uh based on the representations made by the management, it is in consonance with your framework. So therefore, you'll check whether there is enough, uh, whether there is a suitable criteria or framework, and the management would agree and understood its responsibility in the presentation of the financial statement. 
that's for initial audit. So generally, we do the following. One, two, three, four. First, we investigate or research the client background. Next, we inquire from other firm, personal, or third parties. We also communicate with the predecessor auditor. And then we look into the auditability of the client's financial statement or other preconditions or preconditions to accept or continue. Now, if that is a continuing audit or an existing client, what would be your procedure? So existing clients should be re-evaluated upon the occurrence of the following. So in short, you will not evaluate every time you will do audit. Again, for continuing client, you don't need to evaluate every time you do your audit. You will only evaluate again whether you will accept or continue if there is a change in management, directors, or ownership. That is because you will again check the integrity of the management. So look at this one. So we have here the old management. We have here the old management. And then that is a continuing client. If that is an old management and a continuing client, you already check their integrity, right? Therefore, if you continue, will you check again the integrity? Not anymore because it is still the same management. But what if there is now a new management? So you have here your old integrity check for the old management. And since there's a new management, you need to check again their preconditions. Therefore, you need again to do the pre-engagement activities. That's why if there is a change in management, director or ownership, you need again to do your pre-engagement activities. And then if there is a change in the nature of the client's business, that is because we need to understand whether we can really do or we can um, provide our audit work. Therefore, if there is a change now as to the nature of the client's business, you check whether the uh, auditor is competent for that new nature of business. If not, then you reject. But if yes, you can still accept. So there are only two instances wherein we do again your pre-engagement activities or we evaluate your client relationship. If there's a change in management, that is because that bursts into in the integrity of the management. You check again the integrity. And for the change in business, you check whether you are independent and at the same time, whether the auditor is competent. Now, let's look into the compliance with ethical requirements and independence. Now, we said earlier that um, as part of your um, preliminary engagement activity, we check into independence and competence. So we try to comply with the ethical requirements and the independence depend, uh, based on the code of ethics for professional accountants. Now, first, we determine independence. So for independence, we look whether the um, the uh, the auditor is independent, of course, not only in mind but also in appearance. Also, whether the uh, auditor is competent. So for competence, we look whether you obtain the necessary skills so that you can properly provide the audit. So the auditor should obtain an understanding of the client's business and industry, whether you have the competence for the nature of the business of the client. So earlier we said, you do again your pre-engagement activity if in case if in case there's a change in nature of the business because we look into the competence. So again here, um, before accepting, you need to check into whether you are competent with the nature or the industry of your client. So let's say, for example, um, the, your client is within the insurance industry, therefore you check whether you understand insurance because if not, then possibly you will not really perform well your audit. But it doesn't mean, guys, it doesn't mean that if you're, if you're not competent, you will not accept. Again, let's say before audit, before audit or before acceptance, prior acceptance, let's say, you lack the necessary competence. You lack the necessary competence. Therefore, what will you do? You can either accept or you can reject. Now, if you accept, this is what you need to do. If the auditor does not possess the expertise, you should obtain knowledge of matters that relate to the nature of the entity's business and industry. But it doesn't mean that during your pre-engagement and you understood that you are not competent, you already reject. It's not automatically reject. You look whether you can possess that industry expertise. If yes, then you can accept. If not, then you reject. Furthermore, 
if you have a set and you think you lack really the expertise, you can also um get the work of an expert, but um not at all times, not at all times, only on certain or specific matters. Next, we look into whether we can serve the client properly. So to look whether we can serve the client properly, the auditor or the firm must have the capability, time, and resources to perform the audit. As I, as I told you earlier, whenever we talk about your competence, we don't look into only whether we are competent as to our skills, but whether we can uh, serve the client properly. And when we say we serve the client properly, whether we have the enough resources to perform the audit work. And we look into the following items to determine whether we can serve the client properly or we have the enough resources. Take note, in your auditor's independence and auditor's competence, for auditor's independence, it is purely independence. You evaluate your ethical requirements as to your independence. Now, as to your ethical requirements of auditor's competence, Competence embodies both professional competence, meaning the skills necessary to perform the audit, and at the same time, whether you can serve the uh, client properly, that is whether we have enough resources to serve the client. Now, to check whether we have enough resources to serve the client, we look into the following items. First, whether there is appropriate qualified staff when the work is performed. Again, that is as to your planning, staffing. So we look whether your staff can perform the job or not. Next, whether the firm can complete the engagement within the deadline. So you look into whether with your current resources and your staff, you can finish the engagement. Next, look into whether you need an expert assistance. And we already said that earlier. Next, you consider the knowledge of your personnel, whether they can really perform that. We said we look into the professional competence of the firm itself. And then lastly, as to the number of your personnel to conduct the audit. In short, whenever you are asked ability to serve client properly, it talks only to your capability, time, and resources in the performance of the audit. And when we talk about professional competence, we look into whether you have the necessary expertise. Again, let's lay it out. First, we look into integrity. We check both for new client or continuing client. But take note, for continuing client, you only check it for two instances. The first instance, of course, if there is a change in your management. Another instance is that if there is a change in the nature of the business. Also, next, we check into your uh, independence and competence. So for competence, it encompasses your professional competence and at the same time, the ability to serve client properly. And we said earlier, your main procedure there is to evaluate only your compliance. Evaluate compliance. And how do we evaluate your compliance? It's like this. So for professional competence, whether you uh, possess the necessary expertise for ability to serve client properly, whether you have the capability, time, and resources. And to determine your capability, time, and resources, check on the following items. Next, uh, last part of your pre-engagement activity is to ensure that there is no misunderstanding between the client and, of course, the audit firm or the auditor. Now, so that there is no misunderstanding, you need to establish your understanding. And how do you establish the understanding? You establish it through an engagement letter. Okay. Now, again, we need to determine whether that is a new or a recurring client. So first, we determine the preconditions of the audit. So what are your preconditions again? We check if ever you have uh, the management integrity. You check if ever we have independence and competence. And at the same time, we look if ever the management has an applicable financial frame, financial reporting framework. Again, we use that financial rep reporting framework as a criteria to check whether there is enough consonance with the financial statements and the uh, framework. 
Next, we look into whether the management agrees to the premise that it has acknowledged and understood its responsibility. This is your management responsibility. So earlier, we said that uh, as part of your preconditions, we check whether there is a framework and management responsibility. And you check if these preconditions are not present, take note, you shall not accept the proposed audit engagement unless it is required by law or your regulation. But as a rule, if your preconditions is not present, then you do not accept. First precondition, again, there is a suitable criteria. Because if there is no suitable criteria, take note, we cannot do our audit work. Next, there must be a management responsibility or acceptance of responsibility by the management. Because again, we just look into the degree of correspondence between the responsible party or whatever is provided by the responsible party. Therefore, you should or the auditor should never be the responsible party over the assertions. So in short, the management must agree that it has acknowledged already its responsibility over those assertions. And then, now once there's an understanding and there is your preconditions of audit, then you need now to create or draft your audit engagement letter. But generally, we just call it audit engagement letter, but you can use any other titles for it. But generally, we call it engagement letter. Now, the question is, when will we provide, when to provide audit engagement letter? First, for a new client, it is before commencement of the audit. Why? Because you are documenting the understanding over the terms of your engagement. Therefore, you document the terms of your engagement before you start your engagement or before you start the audit. Therefore, it must be before the commencement. Now, for recurring or continuing audit, you will not send a new engagement letter each period unless there is a change. And to whom should you provide the engagement letter or to whom should you address so addressee, the addressee is anyone or whoever hired the CPA. Again, your engagement letter, when should you provide? If that is a new client, you provide before commencement. And if that is a recurring client or a continuing client, you do not need to provide a new engagement letter unless there is a change as to your engagement, unless there is a change as to your engagement letter. So generally, if there is a change or as to the terms of your engagement letter, then you provide a new engagement letter. But if there is no change, then you do not provide a new engagement letter. Aside from change on your terms, another reason to provide a new engagement letter for recurring is in case you want to remind the client, reminder to the client, that um, these are the provisions on the engagement. Therefore, you send again the engagement letter only as a form of reminder. Again, engagement letter is not really required for recurring because, again, as long as you have the same terms of engagement, then whatever is the engagement letter before or engagement contract before, that will still uh, be binding between the parties. Unless there is a change in terms, you need to provide new engagement letter or um, you want to emphasize some items on your engagement letter, you want to remind, then you provide again a new engagement letter. For a new client, you always need to provide an engagement letter and preferably, take note, preferably before commencement. It is not required to be provided before commencement, but it is preferred by the standard that you provide it before commencement. Now, what are the contents of your engagement letter? So before we go with your engagement letter, again, you do your pre-engagement activities. You check into integrity, you check into independence, competence, and whether you can serve the client properly. After that, you will do now a preliminary conference with the client. Now, in your preliminary conference, you will tell the client about the specific services you will render, the cooperation and work expected to be performed by the client's personnel. That is more about uh, letting them provide all the necessary documents whenever asked by the auditor. And then the completion and start dates of the engagement. 
And the nature and limitations of the audit engagement, and you already know that, and the state uh, estimate of the fee. Now, once you already agreed on those terms, you now provide an engagement letter. And what is an engagement letter? An engagement letter is an agreement between the CPA firm or the auditor and the client on the conduct of the audit. So again, it documents the understanding, documents the understanding over the engagement. So it is a letter from the auditor to the client management. And when signed by the client, it serves as a formal written contract between them. Okay, so that is for your engagement letter. Now, contents of your engagement letter, again, we said objective and scope, responsibilities of the auditor, responsibilities of the management, the reporting framework, and the form and content of any report. Take note, reference to any form and content of any report to be issued by the auditor. Okay, form and content. Lagi tong lumalabas na MCQs, form and content ang tinatanong, okay? Or ang ibibigay doon. Hindi mismo kung anong type of opinion. Form of opinion. Normally, yun yung, yung, yung pinapalit dyan. But what is normally asked there is the form and content of the reports to be issued. Furthermore, you can also make reference as to the presence of auditories, unrestricted access to records, the scope of audit, and then the fees, expectation, etc. And also, you can provide their other arrangements, such as for experts, if in case you need some experts, internal auditors, whether you will use the work of an internal auditor, whether you will communicate with the predecessor auditor, as to the uh, restriction of your auditor's liability and any other agreement that you want to provide under your engagement letter. So it must be properly documented. Next, audit of components. So what is an audit of components? So generally, um, what if, what if um, that is not purely a, a one, one business entity or it is an entity wherein it has different components or it, it has different subsidiaries or branches. So how do we do our pre-engagement activities and how do we provide our engagement letters? So the following are factors to be considered for audit of components. So factors to consider whether to send a separate engagement letter to the component when the auditor of the parent company is also the auditor of its component. So first, who appoints the auditor of the component? You check at it. So, sir, paano yan? Let's say subsidiary, uh, ito si parent. Di ba? Ang component niya is yung subsidiary. Now, doon sa parent, iba yung nag-appoint. Subsidiary, iba rin. So, let's say P1, P2. So, magkaiba yung nag-appoint. Since magkaiba yung nag-appoint, therefore, magkaiba dapat yung addressing mo. So, magbibigay ka uli ng bagong engagement letter. Pero kung pareho lang naman yung nag-appoint, edi, no need to provide a new engagement letter. Next, whether a separate auditor's report is to be issued on the component. So, if there's a separate, then you need to provide an engagement letter to the component. Legal requirements in relation to audit appointments. So, if ever the legal requirement is to have a separate engagement letter as to the component, then you need to provide a new engagement letter. And the extent of any work performed by auditors, if there is a component auditor also, then you need to place that in the engagement letter. And the degree of ownership by parents and the independence of components management. So generally, as a rule, um, if ever there is no change as to the engagement with the parent and the component, then you can only provide one engagement letter. But if ever, uh, there are different terms with the parent and the component, then you need to provide separate engagement letters. So again, your main consideration for audit components is whether you will only provide one or a separate engagement letter. One, if ever the terms are the same for both the parents uh, for both the parent and the component. But if there are changes as to the terms, then you provide a separate 
if there's a separate uh, appointee or the separate uh, persons who appoints the auditor or different addresses, then you provide a separate engagement letter. And then for recurring audit, as we said earlier, you only provide a new engagement letter if there's a revision of the terms or change in terms, as we said earlier. And then if ever you want to remind your client of the terms of the engagement letter. So again, um, pre-engagement activities. So for pre-engagement activities, we have the following. First, we have your integrity, and then we have your independence, and then we have your competence, and then your understanding. So first, for integrity, you check your integrity, whether that is a new client or a recurring client. So for a new client, you need to uh, inquire or investigate as to the integrity of your client. You can also communicate communicate with predecessor auditor and take note you need to determine what to communicate and how do you communicate and we said even if the client will not allow you to communicate with the predecessor auditor that is okay as long as based on your professional judgment you can still accept the client next as to your recurring or continuing client you just provide or you check into integrity if there's a change in your management or a change in the nature of the business. Now, for independence, you already know the, the, the things to check in for your independence. And then you have your, your professional competence or competence. We look into the competence itself, whether you have the expertise. And at the same time, you have the ability to serve the client properly and then you have also your um understanding you document your understanding through an engagement letter and we said for a new you provide an engagement letter for recurring generally you do not provide an engagement letter except if ever there's a change in your management or um no there's a change in your terms Except if there's a change in your terms or you want to remind the client of the terms. Furthermore, do not forget as to the preconditions of the audit. That is the framework and the acknowledgement of management responsibility. Do not also forget as to the effect of the audit of your component, whether or not you provide an engagement letter or not. So whether you provide one engagement letter for both or a separate engagement letter for both. So last item for this topic, change in engagement. So what if there is a change in engagement? So what happens here? So you already have an engagement letter, right? You already documented the understanding. Now, what if there's a change in the engagement? So you look into whether there's a change in the terms of the engagement or you change the assurance. So if there's a change in the terms of engagement, if the change is reasonable, then what is the effect? And what if unreasonable? So if ever it is reasonable, you always agree. If unreasonable, you disagree. Okay. So if there's a change in terms of engagement, if the reason is... um enough for you such that such that the following is present and of the following so there's a change in circumstances which affects the requirements of the entity or there is initially a misunderstanding therefore you agree on the change of the terms but if the reason is of course unreasonable you disagree if you want to change to a lower assurance you again determine whether the reason or whether it is reasonable or not if reasonable you agree if unreasonable, you disagree. And when can we say that the change to a lower assurance is reasonable? First, if there's a change in circumstances in the affecting entities and requirements, misunderstanding, and there is a restriction on the scope of the engagement. So if that is, or any of those are the reasons, or any of those is the reason, then you agree. But if not, then you disagree. Always remember, 
if ever reasonable, agree. If unreasonable, you disagree. Now, if you are unable to agree, what if you are unable to agree? So you cannot agree, you cannot disagree. Then you can now, you can now withdraw from the engagement. Take note, withdraw if only unable to agree or it is not permitted or allowed. So you withdraw. Sir, why, why is there a withdrawal now? There is a withdrawal because there is already an acceptance, right? There is an acceptance. There is already an engagement letter. Now they want to change the engagement. Now if the change in the engagement, you are unable to agree or that is not permitted, then you can now withdraw from the engagement. Withdraw from the engagement. Okay? That's it for pre-engagement activities.